we've been interested for quite a while in the IDW, Jordan Peterson, and what feels like a kind of great intellectual awakening. So far, it's been a bit of a countercultural phenomenon, and a lot of people have kind of described it as being on the right or being against the left. And so, what we're really interested in doing is kind of unpicking what the left has to learn from the IDW movement itself. Whether you kind of agree with them politically or whatever, if you watch some of these some of these programs with Eric Weinstein, Brett Weinstein, um, Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, you realise that they are talking about very fundamental things, very important fundamental things. There's a real awareness of the of the challenges that we face as a society. So it seems the right thing to do is to try and understand and to be part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say a part of what drew me into listening more and more to these folks is like being challenged and then saying, wow, but they're also really smart. They're doing their conversations, as you said, slowing conversations down instead of five minute sound bites on legacy media, <clears throat> you know, media forms, which are so simplifying and reductionistic. It's allowing people to sit and think out loud together in long form ways and tease apart really complex ideas. But they're also able to touch on really hot button issues that have kind of been off limits in certain ways, especially when you start talking about the left. The left have certain topics and issues and if you don't toe the line, you can easily be exiled or if nothing else questioned and frowned upon. But they're starting to touch on some of these and I, you can say what you want about many of them and obviously I don't agree with a lot of things a lot of them say but they're modeling how to have conversations and talk about things and they're smart people mm -hmm. and even if you disagree it's really refreshing to have real discourse and intellectual um, people talking about really important issues and I will say I mean I, I think you're right and you've said this before around compared with the right <clears throat> and the complete control over the government in the United States and jail cells and guns and police and military. The left has more soft power. It's more in the academia, universities, also Hollywood and cultural, you know, um, forms. I will say when I was first encountering Peterson at Nike, challenged but then intrigued by some of his critiques of the left, and then I'd hear him talk about this that slide into you know, Soviet Union and 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 genocide and the you know gulag but then I was also hearing about Brett Weinstein at Evergreen and I was really curious so when I finally watched that live raw footage of what happened at Evergreen it was really shocking and it was like I just didn't expect to see that you know young people people of color and white allies fighting for racial justice and diversity and equity doing this mob mentality of a white man who was a white man but who's also a Bernie supporter and Occupy Wall Street guy solidly on the left, solidly an ally, and to watch just how that unfolded, and it m <clears throat> ends by them wandering the, the campus with baseball bats mm -hmm. and disarming the police, and of course the president of the college did not help with that situation. It brought up that question of like, it's not going to be this totalitarian takeover, but it's also not completely benign if if you if you imagine people gaining more and more power with that kind of frenetic chaotic mm. mob mentality which you know one of Peterson's critique which I still grapple with is I think he quotes Orson Welles or someone saying the bourgeoisie is not so they're not driven so much by love for the poor as mm. much as by hatred and envy of the rich mm. and that's really touchy and that's a fine line but I, I hear him naming that when sometimes when I see it playing out folks on the left I'm like it doesn't feel this open-hearted compassionate mm focus on the poor, it's like there's a lot of shadow. A shadow. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. And there's a need for direct action and activism that disrupts systems, but a point that Brett Weinstein makes is that universities are not the right target to be channeling all that energy. Channel that into organizing to vote out, you know, Republicans in Congress, or channel that into, mm -hmm. you know, uh, protesting police brutality and pr police violence. Like, the university is, is this um, really safe, protected area that does already value mm. these things yeah. and is so much more progressive than society at large. Why are you wasting your yeah. energy here? Well, that's the paradox, I think, because it's a soft target. Right. You can have wins. Yeah. Like, if, if, you, if you target your kind of accusations of bigotry at progressive people, they will take it seriously. Yeah. Oh my God, I'm, I'm sorry, am I, am I, yeah. is there a microaggression here? I, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, 
whereas the people on the right yeah. will, won't listen. It's much harder. So it's it's kind of it, it's yeah it, it is the soft targets in mm -hmm. some in some sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but the, you you mentioned the intellectual dark web, and I think that's there's two things going on. There's there's the nature of the the views of the people within it, and then there's the nature of the conversation. Yeah. And I think that is why you also talked about it as a as a really enlivening experience. And I had the same experience watching some of the Dave Rubin shows with the, like the Weinsteins and Peterson and Shapiro. There's a sense of intellectual adventure yes. in these conversations. And I think on the Joe Rogan show as well, there's a sense of mm -hmm. that's what thinking looks like. And I think we, we've been starved of actually seeing people thinking. Yes, and I would say another piece of it was that I <clears throat> I've never really engaged, to be perfectly honest, and listened with real integrity and openness to conservative thinkers, people on the right. I've been, I was so in the left bubble that it was like, legitimately my, my belief was, we on the left are just right, we're just right about everything. So we just need to kind of like wait for the people on the right to wake up and realize this, they're either completely also stupid. Or for them all to die off. And then we <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're stupid or evil or something, can't really understand why they are who they mm -hmm. are. And so engaging and watching some of these conversations in the intellectual dark web has really helped drive home this perspective, which was new to me, mm. uh, around it's not that the conservatives and the right are, are right, are correct, but it's like we on the left, we need the conservatives for that dialectic. We need to think together to come to new truths. And if you cut out one side of it, mm. that's, that's in, inherently problematic. And so you get that idea of like, um, we need diversity of viewpoints. If we're all about inclusivity and diversity and mm. inclusion, we need to be inclusive of different political, you know, beliefs, different viewpoints. Mm. And I think on the left, that can be it can be really dried. You know, you don't have that. Which is the paradox of the left: the obsession with diversity, but diversity within a very I ideologically kind of narrow. Band. Yes. Mm. And so you have some folks having really interesting conversations that go into taboo spaces where on the left you can't go. If you bring those up, it's really, you become a lightning rod. Um, and there's folks here who are, you know, and I think it was Peterson or someone was speaking about the intellectual dark web and they said, if we're gonna argue and disagree, I wanna hear the best argument mm -hmm. for that. Like, we don't wanna set up straw men, you know, and bad arguments you can dunk on. And mm -hmm. you wanna mm -hmm. find people who are really intelligent and articulate and can give you the best argument for that if you're pro-life. What's the best argument for your belief in that? What, like, mm -hmm. let's at least engage on a, on a higher level of intellectual discourse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. And you know, this issue of the complexity of the world, of the society that we live in right now has come up. And um, I have found in talking to um, friends of mine who are into the intellectual dark web and um, also have a background in complexity theory, a, a friend of mine who I've been arguing with over politics for a decade now, is always pointing out to me that, you know, universal health care, for example, um, other societies have instituted this decades ago and their systems are not perfect but maybe better than what we have in the United States. But given our unique cultural situation, our unique history, it's not a simple matter to trans transition from what we have now to something else. And we don't, because of the complexity of the issue, we don't know what could go wrong mm -hmm. in that transition. That's we right. could end up worse than we are now. Mm, right. And so it's got me thinking, okay, maybe we need to move more slowly here. I do think that everyone should have health care as a right. That's my value proposition. Mm -hmm. But how do we get there? Um, I don't think the insurance companies are going to be much help. But it's like we need to make allies here. And, mm. and create a system that won't lead to a collapse, um, which wasn't predicted, because the value can guide you to the mm. end, but the means still re mm. remains to be discovered. Mm. Mm. I, th I think it's um, that, that, to that point, the first stage for me has to be getting, learning how to be non-reactive. Yeah. Um, and I, it's interesting that we both kind of teach meditation, you know, and, and practice, like that is effectively the practice. Mm. It's being able to have yourself as the observer and the content being observed, having that distance between. Mm -hmm. I think without that ability, it's almost impossible to have the conversation because we know from strong evidence from neuroscience that we make decisions emotionally first and then post-rationalize them a second later. Yeah. So with that in mind, it, it's no surprise to me that 
until now there's been just a deep polarization. Um, and I think I see that in the intellectual dark web. I see a level of non-reactivity with, hmm, I kind of dis disagree with that. They're disagreeing with each other, but kind of having a generative conversation. I think that's where some of the power lies mm. of spreading that out to society. I mean, like, hey, let's have a conversation where we're not just um, in a reactive loop. Right? Mm -hmm. right. And it's about having a position as well. And coming back to your point about politics, something I heard Brett and Eric talk about was we know that none of the solutions work. We know that libertarianism doesn't work mm, yeah. for gain theoretic reasons. We know that capitalism doesn't work for gain theoretic reasons. We know that socialism won't work for gain theoretic reasons. We know that all of these sort of solutions don't work. So let's, we have a blank slate. We have a, or we have a, yeah, we have, we, we have to work with our evolutionary toolkit yeah. because we know these, this is what we've been given and work within that. So that's a, that's also a kind of um, a really interesting place to start this conversation mm -hmm. from as well, which I think most of the people within the intellectual dark web would say, yeah. certainly from a political perspective, we're starting from zero because we know none of the solutions are going to get us through. Right. Mm. right. And yet we also have to start where we are, unless mm. there's going to be yeah. a complete collapse. And sometimes mm. you need the blank slate mm. before you can build something new. I'm mm. not sure if we should be inviting that or all ex too excited about that, yeah. but that could be the situation. It's happening. Mm. Um, but, you know, I really like to think about this in terms of media technologies. The evolution of human consciousness is simultaneously the evolution of media technologies, communication mm -hmm. technologies. You know, it used to be the drama around the fire uh, and just primal speech and song, and then the first mm -hmm. script, alphabetic consciousness, radio, or the, sorry, the printing press, you can't skip that. Without the printing press, there's no democracy. Mm -hmm. um, radio, television, the internet, there are specific modes of consciousness facilitated by each of these technologies. Mm -hmm. And the intellectual dark web is very much the, the birth of a new media environment, mm -hmm. superseding the old mass media mm -hmm. technologies, mm -hmm. decentralizing thought yeah. in a way that mass media was able to <coughs> sort of get a handle on. And, you know, the printing press was what allowed for the French Revolution, the Protestant Refo Re Revolution, <coughs> um, Reformation, the American Revolution, and print consciousness, literate consciousness, the type that will read pamphlets, newspapers, is a very um, non-reactive form of consciousness in mm -hmm. a sense. It's more intellectual and less emotional. It's not that there wasn't emotion involved in politics before radio and, mm -hmm. and television, but people were able to consider the argument and sit through an uh, eight-hour Lincoln-Douglas debate. You know, Can you imagine people sitting through eight hours of politicians debating with one another? No way. So with, with radio, you had the risk of fascism that you know, was being developed in the 30s, and there's one voice, the Fuhrer, who's disseminating this image of the fatherland uh, you know, all across mm -hmm. Central Europe. And, and then with television, which really came to the fore in the 60s, that's when images were coming back from Vietnam, and people were seeing what war actually looks like mm -hmm. for the first time. And that generated this tremendous outpouring of compassion in the anti-war movement, right? So, but the, the blue church, as Jordan Greenhall calls it, has had control over television and newspapers for decades now. Mm -hmm. But that uh, media landscape, that environment, is, is dying off. Mm -hmm. It's really only people over 35 that I think still look to the Washington Post and the New York Times and CNN and MSNBC. Young people are online, and they're getting their information uh, from these more unique, um, it's, it's, there's more diversity online in mm. terms of the conversations that are being had. You're also starting to see the way it's breaking down. Legacy yeah. media is, is. CNN, it's MSNBC. It's too centralized. So up. that movement to like blockchain and like digital currencies is, I think, happening in the same way. It's decentralized yeah. with all the beauty and excitement and also the challenges and pitfalls. But I think you're starting to see, you know, this post-truth world where suddenly there can be fake news on the left. Yeah and New York Times doing these hit pieces on Peterson that is just promoting blatantly false, you know, insinuations and accusations. And so suddenly there's like, what is true, what's not? And that dovetails into, you know, one of Jordan Greenhall's and, and Daniel Schmachtenberger's pieces around sense making. And like, mm -hmm. what is sense making? Our, our capacity to make sense of the world mm -hmm. and then be able to be agents and have agency and make decisions and choices mm -hmm through having you know, a sense of meaning 
and understanding, but it's like data overload. So on the one hand, it's decentralizing. We're also getting completely swamped with data, information, yeah. viewpoints. How do mm. we sort that? Mm. What sources do we look to? Like, and I think that's what some, the intellectual dark web is doing. When it's I'm not, yeah. overwhelmed, it's an alternative sense making. It's alternative mm -hmm. sense making, mm -hmm. and it's been the mm -hmm. cracks. But that's opening, and the electricity that's there that we both mm -hmm. talked about. Mm -hmm. People are flocking to, and it's showing people are hungry, mm -hmm. and thirsty, and and deprived of some of this form of discourse, thinking, mm -hmm. and and conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think. As a journalist, I've kind of looked at the, the influx of fake news and the kind of the, the continuing downward spiral of, of the news media and been very um, concerned by it. Like it's like I, I've worked with a lot of very talented people. I know that this kind of anti-journalism kind of conspiracy theory is not is at least only partially true. And I, I've sort of seen since I've been outside the media that there are ways of groupthink. There, there, there's certainly a way of groupthink and there's a certain kind of um, bias to the media, the sort of blue church thing that Jordan Greenhall talks about. And I'm more, more aware of that since I've been out of it. But I'm also aware of the difficulty of producing good news, the amount of money that it costs to send someone to the Middle East for a long time and understand what's going on and all these things. So I've been kind of looking at how quickly it's losing its credibility and been really worried by that like yeah. it's it's like we're losing the best some of that's irreplaceable some of that's irreplaceable mm. and then it's only since the the breakthrough of the the intellectual dark web conversation that i've got a sense that there is a kind of bottom up new sense making apparatus that's being selected for by the internet like these people are being selected for by their by the number of people watching them and Dave Rubin talks about they're almost being forced together because they're being asked mm -hmm. to go on each other's podcasts. There's a, there is hopefully a new sense making, and I, and I, I also think this is probably an early stage. The intellectual mm -hmm. dark web is, I've kind of called it a, a beachhead. It's like a kind of beachhead mm -hmm. into enemy territory to say, okay, we're gonna have, start having a new kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. And I, I also think that it may well be, in some sense, the intellectual dark web died once it was named by the New York Times mm. because it's no longer the dark web. Yeah. And th that framing of these are the voices that are being kept out of the mainstream conversation immediately flips into, no, these are new media successful new media entrepreneurs right. who are creating an alternative to the mainstream media. I mean, Joe Rogan gets, what, 90, 100 million downloads and views a month? Yeah, allegedly I mean, he's the most powerful podcaster. <laughs> so most powerful media person who, uh, who's ever lived. Right. So the idea of that, it, it was a fascinating thing. Like at the moment of it being named, it ceased to be what it was. It's but that's of one of the things, and, and you said yeah. this, Matt, like Joe Rogan seems to just have whoever he wants under his podcast. They could be talking about UFOs and aliens, psychedelics, mm. people mm. like Peterson or Ben Shapiro, you know, but there's something refreshing about, wow, here's a mainstream guy with a huge reach, a huge audience. Mm. And it seems that whoever he's interested in, and he doesn't have to agree with them on anything, mm -hmm. just to have, and that's something that's really refreshing. And it, is. Mm. it seems mm. important. Yeah. yeah, and I think the other thing with Joe Rogan is, because you, you would never think of Joe Rogan as an intellectual in the same way that, say, Brett Weinstein right. or Eric Weinstein is. But he is part of the intellectual dark web because of the nature of the kind of conversations he's able to host. Yeah. That he, He's genuinely interested, yeah. he's genuinely learning, and he's genuinely inquiring. Mm -hmm. And he this, asks this the type concept. of questions that expand the conversation mm. beyond just academia or those who identify as intellectuals. And it, and it flags up how, and this is something Jordan Greenhall's talked about as well, is that we have, because of the increased complexity of the world and the chaotic nature of, of, of existing in it, we have increasingly replaced thinking with a facsimile of thinking. Yeah. reactivity, yeah. Yeah. responses, yeah. and what this is again flagging up is, oh, this is, this is actually what thinking looks like, where yeah. you're able, and that's a, it's a process of courage, and it's a process it of self-reflection, and all of these things, it's, it's yeah. yeah. Mass mm. media trains people to say what sounds smart. Mm. Mm. In mm. education, main, mainstream university education generally trains yeah. people to say what sounds smart. Right. In other words, it's not what's actually thought through rigorously, mm for oneself, it's what's gonna 
advance you in the type of society that we live in. Mm -hmm. And you know, one thing that's great about the intellectual dark web is that I get the sense that they're accountable to their audience. Mm -hmm. Mainstream media is not accountable to their audience. Mm -hmm. They're accountable to their advertisers because that's mm -hmm. who's paying the bills. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge difference. It's a huge difference. Yeah. And that allows them to be flexible and nimble. And they'll just be like, okay, mm -hmm. we've been asked the two of us to do a podcast, or let's have the four of us sit right. down. Mm -hmm. They're on a different, they're like guerrilla, you know, mm -hmm. warfare. It's just a different, yeah. a different mode of interacting, and it's clearly effective. Mm -hmm. And that was to Jordan Greenhall's idea of the blue church versus the red. Mm -hmm. The blue is still trying to catch up the legacy news media and, and the left, which has kind of become the hegemony, like the, the mm -hmm. mainstream, no longer the countercultural force, is trying to understand how Trump and some of this right, mm -hmm. you know, some of the red mm -hmm. church has, is like guerrilla warfare, and we're still lining up like in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And we're trying to figure out the technology or the moves that they're mm -hmm. making. And until mm -hmm. we can figure that out, they're going to run circles around us. Mm -hmm. And I think we're just really in this in-between space of trying to understand mm -hmm. what the landscape is. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I pick up as well, I, I don't think, I mean, in the UK at least, we don't really have much advertising in news. Mm -hmm. like the BBC is, is advertising free. I used to work for Channel 4 News, which barely has any advertising as well. But there is still the same, same group think. And I think yeah. actually a much more a much more powerful force is peer pressure. Mm. It's what other people will think of you. It's it's yeah. it's the group mm. think within within any within any media in, industry. I'm not so sure the advertisers have much have much power over that. At least at the the level of the individual decisions of the reporters, mm. it's much more. Am I a good person if I think this? What will my friends think of me? What will other people in the newsroom? Yeah. The reporters I know are much more worried about what other reporters think of them yeah. and other people within the industry think of them mm -hmm. than, than some yeah. people outside, I'd say. Yeah. It, it does depend though, I think, you know, with Gamergate, that the way that sort of began was, you know, popular gaming websites, very much Blue Church, yeah. siding with the publishers when gamers were complaining about certain things. And that created, it's, it's a little microcosm of what's happening now on the wider scale. Yeah. Mm. It's we cannot trust you as sense makers, yeah. therefore we need new sense making apparatuses. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, it might be a little different in the UK versus here because advertising bombards you on you mm. know, cable news networks especially, mm. Mm -hmm. maybe not as much on broadcast television. Um, but, you know, activists on the left have learned that if you want to get someone like Sean Hannity or anyone on Fox News to apologize for something, go after their advertising revenue <laughs> right. mm -hmm. and tell those companies that you're not going to buy their products if they don't pull their ads from that show. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden the tune changes on the show. So. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting difference between the UK and the US as well. But yeah. This is, again, coming back to, to Brett and Eric Weinstein talking about, yeah. which I think is a really great understanding, certain types of things do not survive encounter with the profit motive. Yeah. Mm. And truth-seeking in particular does not survive an encounter with the profit motive. Mm -hmm. So universities, news, anything that involves seeking truth is corrupted by, by, by money. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, it, it probably is a very different situation mm -hmm. here, and I think there's something, speaking for the, the, the far-sightedness of, of the people who put the BBC together in the 1920s, was this is such a powerful technology that we need to have it at least an arm's length from government and an arm's yeah. length from commercial pressures, uh -huh. yeah. which, which I guess you don't have we so have much We have National Public US. Radio, NPR, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. everyone on the right thinks that it's controlled by the government mm. or whatever. And but it's also, I mean, the BBC is this massive organization. Right, yeah. It's got mm -hmm. a huge number of TV stations, a huge number of radio stations. I mean, uh, it, it, it's not, like the comparison is... And NPR is tiny. Yeah. 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 And you get people really railing against Peterson with his Patreon account and people making a lot of money. But a part of me is like, OK, so you set up a Patreon account. If people like what you're doing, mm -hmm. you can be supported. And that's also just a different model. Mm. You know, yeah. it's decentralized to a certain extent. Mm. I mean, I'm sure there's problems with it as well. Well, it's but the viewership paying directly for the kind of um, content that they'd like to see. Yeah. And, mm. and Peterson and these other guys seem to be pretty responsive to mm. what their audience asks of them. Yeah. You know, mm. that's what's driving their whole media operation. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so it's not like these huge companies creating content that they think will be good for their advertisers. Mm. or that their bubble suggested is what people want to hear, mm. and then they just beam it out at everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a feedback yeah. mechanism. Right. There's interaction here. Right. Mm. I'm, I'm interested to ask you guys where you think we are. 
we, we just got a, uh, an email from Ken Wilber's people. Um, and they're tracking the same sort of thing. Ken Wilber, the integral philosopher. Our suggestion, my suggestion in one of the, the articles that I wrote was that what is happening is an emerging integral conversation. Yeah. So integral, for, for people who don't know, is, is the idea that there are ideological ways of looking at the world and integral is a kind of almost like an evolutionary step change beyond that into a space where we're able to see all the ideologies but able to, to kind of access yeah. a place beyond that. Mm -hmm. And that to me feels accurate as a kind of diagnosis and I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated what you guys make of why it's emerging now, what it shows about the society we're in and where it might be going as a as a conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, I do think, I remember hearing it, it might have been Jeff Salzberg on Daily Revolver. Um, this idea of the intellectual dark web is integral. Um, you know, like on one hand, yes, like trying to, I think a lot of people in the integral community are trying mm -hmm. to grapple with, say, Jordan Peterson. Mm. Like one minute he's sounding completely integral, the next moment he's sounding not. Um, trying to unpack it, I know there's no clear, you cross the threshold and you are integral or you're not, you're always moving back and forth, whatnot. I guess you could stabilize or center in more at one stage than another, but I know one critique or one challenge uh, for Peterson and maybe the intellectual dark web in general is that when they start to critique postmodernism, mm. either scientific materialism or the world-centric postmodernism, as if it's a mistake, and there should be more of a movement backwards or away from, that might not be constituting integral thinking because in, in integral philosophy or theory, you want to transcend and include all the stages and modalities of mm. thinking and all the truths prior. Mm. So you want to move into and above and beyond scientific materialism, which can be very reductionistic and materialistic you know, em empirically backed science to include more of the numinous, the mythological, the spiritual, mm. the metaphysical, but it's different than the mythic or the magical or the archaic levels. Mm. And I think sometimes I think of it as like chakra systems. You know, there's truths to each chakra and a lot of people in the self-help or mm. on the left or in the, there are loves Sam these. Sam Harris would love that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. <laughs> but there are these heady or like these spiritual centers, but there's like, I see Peterson sometimes is reclaiming like amber, mm. orange, amber, red, and these lower chakras like, get your room in order. Mm -hmm. Learn how to mm. relate to money and mm. to sex and to power. And those are difficult shadow places, especially yeah. for folks in a spiritual yeah. community. I, mean, I suppose mm. the, the question is, how big can your container be? You know, how big is an individual? How much can you hold? And that's that's part of the that's where I see the link with the intellectual dark web and the integral, um, whether or not it's an entirely integral way of looking at the world. I'm not sure. I think it's it's, you know, as you said, it goes up and down and it's it's more chaotic than that. But, you know, I, I very much get that sense of that's what's needed is the ability to exactly what you said, be able to hold the pre-modern as well as the the kind of the higher levels of you know understanding and uh you know you mentioned the pre-trans fallacy before it's it's also being able to pick out when is that pre-modern understanding actually supporting a, a bigger integration of society as a whole because we do need all of those things and i think it is confusing for people because you know peterson one you know, is, there's many different Petersons in a way, mm -hmm. but part of integral is that you can hold all of these different um, levels of development and honor them and know that they each have their own place within the whole. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so that's really, you know, that's an exciting prospect to see society moving towards there, but it is like a birth. It's um, yeah. Mm. hard. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I studied Wilbur deeply from, for probably five or six years. Mm -hmm. um, starting around the time I was like 19 and um, through Wilbur I got interested in this Swiss cultural historian and mm -hmm. cultural phenomenologist Jean Gebser who inspired Wilbur in many ways uh, and also Sri Aurobindo who um, is connected to the founding of CIIS actually mm -hmm. uh, another integral philosopher uh, and I really like Gebser's way of, of, of framing the evolution of the human species um, he's a little suspicious of the term evolution because it implies progress. And for Gebser, consciousness moves through these structures in a way that's both, both progressive and regressive. Mm -hmm. You gain something and you lose something with each mo movement mm -hmm. until you get to the integral, which then mm -hmm. reclaims everything. Mm -hmm. right? So 
The archaic structure is when we're still primal peoples immersed within nature. Mm -hmm. No sense of differentiation between the human being as some special species with a spirit that none of the rest of nature has, right? Mm -hmm. Then you get magical consciousness. It's the next structure where human beings begin to grapple with the power that comes from language and symbol. Um, and, you know, they're, they're gaining a sense for shaman shamanic practices mm -hmm. and ritual. And then from there you move to the mythic where story and narrative um, becomes more pronounced. So it's not just like the power of single words, it's the power of, of whole narratives. Mm. Um, and then with the modern period, right around the time of, you know, I mean, it goes back to Aristotle and the ancient mm. Greeks and then the scientific revolution, that replaces the mythic consciousness with this new sense of the empowered intellect and science and technology that can remake the world to, as we see fit for our own human purposes. And that mental structure tends to cut itself off from its mythic and magical mm -hmm. and archaic mm -hmm. roots. Mm -hmm. It's all the upper chakras and it denies and represses everything below that as irrational mm -hmm. and needing to be at least controlled if not eliminated. Mm -hmm. Like root out, like Sam Harris, no patience for magic, mm -hmm. no patience for myth. Yeah. We've just got to live in the rational mind, right? Mm. The integral structure, which is not, we're not there yet, but the intellectual dark web, I feel like it is at least a space of possibility where that conversation can begin to happen. Mm. Post-modernity should probably be called hyper-modernity because when you look at these postmodern philosophers, so-called, they didn't call themselves that, but they got labeled that. Jacques Derrida, Michel Foucault, uh, Gilles Deleuze, Felix Guattari. Um, they're using, they're deeply studied in the history of Western philosophy. Um, so for someone like Peterson to say that these guys are undermining the Western project, mm. I, if they were around to talk to him about philosophy, we'd see very quickly who the expert in Western philosophy is. Mm. Um, some of his critiques, I feel like, are missing the target. He's not critiquing Derrida. He's critiquing college undergraduates yeah. who haven't really read Derrida. Yeah. Or maybe they've heard a few things from their professor about him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like those actual theorists are not the enemy. Mm. There are a lot of, I think, helpful um, tools, intellectual tools and ideas that we need to incorporate into whatever the integral is. Mm. If you want to fight against fascism, Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari wrote some great books mm. that were trying to really initiate people into a form of consciousness that would be immune to any sort of fascist authoritarian takeover. Mm. Um, and so when I hear Peterson rail against the postmodern theorists, I'm like, dude, you haven't read enough. But this is also mm -hmm. where we can all uh, play with the emerging integral or what's coming next because you have people like Peterson who is bringing some important points and perspectives and then he's missing the mark and mischaracterizing Foucault Nobody's or Derrida. Perfect. Yeah. Nobody's mm. perfect, but it's great because then we can hear that and say, mm. okay, great, let's take some of these points that Peterson's pointing out to some real shadows mm. on the left and in postmodernity. You see where he's lining up with people like Ken Wilber or Jean Gepser or whatnot and you can bring in people who really know the philosophy within post-modernity or post-post-modernity or hyper-modernity, and we can start to synthesize and kind of piece together what mm. is, that's mm. not it, that's not it, that's not it, but what's the new? And Adam Roberts on our podcast said something great, which I th guess it was Foucault, I don't remember about, when the new shows up, it's monstrous. Yeah. It often shows yeah. up as monstrous, but you can feel an archetypal charge there. Mm -hmm a numinous charge that's electric and that is just signaling whether you love it or hate it or polarized by it, mm. it's touching into a nerve center on the collective unconscious mm. level, mm. on an archetypal level, what's happening. And that's why I love Jung and Peterson's idea of Jung bringing in psychology. Mm. We're trying to make sense of, because it's one thing when you're talking about your own individual psychology, and I love James Hillman, you know, he was all about, we've had a hundred years of psychotherapy and the world's getting worse. Mm -hmm. So like, what is going on? And he wants to bring psychology out of the consulting room, out of the one-on-one, -on -one. this is about me, my problem, my pain, this is just my childhood, my mom did this, my dad did this, mm -hmm. and bring it into the world. How do we bring it into politics, into environmentalism? Uh, but also, I love the project of Hillman because he's re-enchanting. He's saying if we take psychology, which is the care mm -hmm. of soul and the study of soul, and we look at the daemon and the soul and the, and the kind of the spiritual core of us, it all gets flattened. And here he's probably with Wilbur and Peterson mm -hmm. by flatland, you know, scientific materialism, mm -hmm. which only keeps us horizontal and in mm -hmm. the superficial level of material reality. 
on that point, and, and to your point as well of this cutting off from the lower archaic levels yeah. with, which we need, I, I often wonder in my head with, with Peterson and Harris having these debates, I'm like, is, is it not the same as psychology being stuck in the consulting room in a sense? Because in order to integrate the, the pre-modern archaic, what Terence McKenna called the archaic revival, that's an experiential mm. mode of being, yeah. not an intellectual one. So they can debate for a hundred years and probably Harris won't shift into feeling the numinous and kind of being down and dirty in a cave dance and being like, oh God, I'm, you know. Yeah. That's a tension that I think is, is yet to be resolved mm. because part of it, you know, I think Terence McKenna was right, part of that archaic revival is reclaiming those ritual traditions, which for a scientific materialist is total woo-woo, you know? And so it's a, di it's, a, it's a difficult tension to resolve, but it's one I think needs to be resolved in a different way than purely through debate. That's important, but there needs to be something else, some experiential mm -hmm. element. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess this, this is sort of pointing forward as well towards what a deeper resolution might be. Mm. Because um, we've talked as well about the, the intellectual, potentially, I see the intellectual dark web potentially coming to some kind of synthesis in terms of, I already think that some of them are, are, are approaching that, like Brett Weinstein talks about how all maps must, all true maps must align so that you can get there through evolutionary biology. You can understand kind of the world using the evolutionary biology map. You can get there through Jungian psychology and those two kind of, they map onto each other quite well. You have the shadow, you have these biological drives that need to be integrated, you have, and then you've got potentially sort of other, other maps that also point in the same direction. Um, we'd probably argue that Wilbur has, has got one of those maps as well. Mm -hmm. um, but that intellectual synthesis is only part of the the issue and then you've got the potential for as Ali was saying you've got to integrate the archaic you've got to integrate sort of the bodily um, the, the embodiment piece mm. is, is is such a key part because we, we're not going to get there just with the intellect mm -hmm. right. right and that's also Rick Tarnas talks a lot about this right he'll map in his classes this large cycle where you start more in, a, in an archaic magical you know participation mystique and then mm. you come through and then you have mo modernity and you have postmodernity and on his graph it's like we're entering just entering into the underworld and it's a descent right it's mm -hmm. the it's the mythic descent into the underworld it's the dissolution it's we're feeling everything starting to shake and and buckle and it's like fractally all these lines of, of division it's like the center cannot hold mm -hmm. and a part of that might be and again, playing loose with the words, but like that solar masculine driving, maybe mental, is coming in, and it's about incorporating the shadow. It's about mm. the, the sacred marriage with the feminine, bringing in the embodiment, the primordial experience. As a culture, having lost all technologies of rit most technologies of ritual and transformation, and mm -hmm. very few elders who are initiated in these mystery traditions that have mm. held societies or cultures together in many ways so we're kind of entering into this you know catabasis Robert Bly talks about mm. catabasis it's like yeah. the descent mm. we don't know what that's gonna look like we can all feel it whether we know mm. how to speak to it or not and I think we're just here I'm enjoying being in this conversation and following the folks in the intellectual dark web just trying to feel into what's happening how can we best show up in this moment how can we mm. offer something to be of service. I, I think service to other human beings is such an important part of meaning making and right. feeling like a life well lived. Mm -hmm. Don't want to just be sitting here intellectualizing and thinking about all it. I, I'm very much trying to find that alignment between thinking out loud with really intelligent people and then how do we act? How do we live those values mm -hmm. in the world? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's important. Yeah. yeah. I, I do find myself resonating quite a bit with Peterson's message about the individual as like the the source of the sacred mm -hmm. and the the, um, the value that all societies must uphold as the highest if mm -hmm. they hope to avoid various forms of oppression mm -hmm. and it makes me think that individual it's not individualism as an ideology that he's mm -hmm. talking about because that in a secular context is it it 
degrades into just selfishness mm. and get what I can for myself and maybe my family would be the one you know, ethical sphere that I'd include as part of myself. But unless our culture can rediscover the sacred, then the individual becomes just, uh, it, 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 it devolves into another ideology. Mm. What happens after death? And what is this life for if my individuality, my ego, will dissolve at the death of this body? Mm. How do we channel that sacred value of the individual into a collective project mm. where what I do in this life in service to individuality mm. also in some way opens out into a society mm. where we're all looking out for each other? Mm. Because you know, there's this retreat into a kind of nationalism as resources become more scarce. And I don't think that's the way forward is not the way backward, just right. to put it mm -hmm. plainly. The only and way out is through. If mm. we're not going to become international, and we can't do it the way global capitalism tried, where, like we discussed earlier, it's mm. like, well, you can have your religion and your culture, just don't believe in it too much, mm. that you're not able to shop at the grocery store and get a job and stuff. Mm. We can't do it that way. We need to acknowledge this cultural pluralism, but in a way that there's some deeper value. Peterson, I love this phrase, he refers to it as a low resolution grand narrative. Mm. A grand narrative that's not so specific that you lose the diversity and you force everyone to conform to one story, mm. Mm. but also not so diffuse that there's no common value system mm. that can guide our activities as human beings mm. into the future. because. This is not a very big planet. Mm. And despite the idea that capitalist ec economists keep preaching that we can keep growing, 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 it's, we're not going to be able to do that. Mm. So what do we do? What are we here for? Mm. What do we value most? What do we want to be doing? Mm. You know? There's a, I want to speak to the, the paradox of individual, mm. individualism or the individual. Because yeah. I think it's a kind of, ca I, the way I see it is a kind of catch-22. Like I'm, I'm also very energized by Peterson's focus on the individual. I've done a lot of sort of personal growth work, a lot of individual uh, development, and some people would sort of describe that sort of selfish or solipsistic. And my experience is that only by really going deeply into myself and really identifying kind of the, 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 the things that I have that keep me selfish, keep me divided from other people, am I really able to come into community with other people? Am I really able to make true contact with others right. and feel that empathy and feel that kind of... Mm -hmm. That for me is the, the ultimate catch-22 and I think it's, it's a big sticking point for the left yeah. when they hear people talking, like Peterson, talking about individual, the individual because like, no, no, it's about the collective, it's about the society. Mm -hmm. And my sense is you cannot jump to that point. Yeah. You can only get to that point from a genuine felt sense once you've done the individual work yeah. of indi individuation that you then feel that you're then acting in the society from a place of genuine empathy, genuine connection, yeah. genuine. Um, yeah. Otherwise, you're pro you're almost certainly playing out your shadow and yeah, playing out your, yeah. your your crap in the world. Yeah, definitely, this is and it's yeah, it's a really good point. Something Alan Ross used to talk about as well. It's that, and I and I think I see this a lot on the left or you know in, in progressive circles is that there's a real efforting to create something that only really has an impact if it doesn't effort it. Mm. You know? So that coming within means that you're, you, you know, you're owning your stuff, you are connected to yourself, and your compassion and your inclusivity emerges naturally because that's right. how you are. You can't help being like that. When the ego is trying to mimic that, it's exactly that. It goes into well, authoritarianism at the worst, and at least a lot of bullying and kind of snideness right. on the other end. Mm -hmm. And so, again, that's, that's part of the necessity for me of this kind of shadow work and also just recontextualizing, focusing on the individual. It's not a selfish mm. thing. It is kind of a selfish thing, but it will lead you to a selfless place. It's right. a good yeah. selfish. I mean, this is the pendulum, right? We're talking mm. about different ways the pendulum swings, and I think you're absolutely right that idea that you know it's kind of like and it's Hillman too saying we need to get out of the consulting room into the world mm. but there's been a move you know there's like either it's all self work everyone's in therapy for themselves it's all about what's mm. going on with me mm. no one's being active no one's going out into the world mm -hmm. trying to help change systems of oppression you might have a person of color sitting in a therapy office and they're saying 
oh, all your anxiety or your depression is connected to what your mother did or your father did, and you're not talking about the systems level of oppression or violence. Mm -hmm. But then you also have this real strong swing towards tackling the systems and systemic inequality and injustice and collective. You have activists who are not only burning out, getting different forms of PTSD, but are also not doing the inner work around their own personal trauma and healing work that needs to happen. And I'm always interested in this, in this intersection of yeah. personal trauma and collective trauma. Mm -hmm. And when are you speaking about one form but it's coming out another way? And I think there are a lot of people who are fighting beautifully for important forms of justice and equality mm -hmm. who might be charged and really angry because they have undigested, unprocessed, unhealed mm -hmm. personal trauma however that could look. Mm -hmm. There's not to deny that collective they're fighting on, be and on the behalf of a group of a marginalized and oppressed group, mm -hmm. but there's no language or container to talk about like, well, mm -hmm. now it feels like you're talking about a systemic issue, but it's coming from a very deep, low place mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. PTSD and trauma. I, I saw a Twitter mm -hmm. bio yesterday that was kind of activist, all angry. Uh -huh. Like the, the fetishization of anger mm -hmm. is a real thing yeah. that, that on, on the left, it's like, well, you should be angry. Look at the way the world is. It's right. like, that doesn't seem a very grounded place to make the changes we need to, right. we need to make. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, this relationship between the individual and the community or society, is, it's a dialectical one. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's recursive, it's a loop, right? Because it's not like we just come into the world as responsible, free-thinking individuals. Mm -hmm. A certain kind of community is necessary that values those things and instills them and enculturates that in, in young people. Mm -hmm. So if human beings don't come into a situation wherein there's equal opportunity for quality housing, they live in a good neighborhood, they go to a good school, they have good mm -hmm. food, if they don't have th this equal opportunity, they're not going to be able to become individuals. So you already, it's, it's, it's a loop, right? It's a yeah. chicken and the egg problem. If you don't have the kind of society that values, you know, early childhood and early education as the platform upon which you then mm. get free thinking, responsible individuals, you're not going to get those as adults. And so, at, but at the same time, you're not going to have that kind of society unless you have free thinking, responsible adults to mm -hmm. invest mm. in creating it and maintaining it. So where do we start? It's like, mm. there's plenty of inner work to do yeah. and there's political yeah. work. Yeah, and it's kind of like, clean your room and maybe we should also acknowledge that some people's rooms are just two walls with no ceiling on it and it's like yeah. they're trying to clean it with hurricanes and rain yeah. right. that right. is important to yeah. remember. I think it's a yes and, right. certainly, right? But it's got to start somewhere. I, my, my own feeling is it's got to, there's got to be an acknowledgement that of course we don't have equal opportunity right now, but we have to start somewhere because I've noticed this in you know, activist communities as well, trying to change an entire system yeah. Where do you start? Where do you start? Yeah. Start with the people in the system. It's not perfect, but yeah. I, there seems to be a kind of mismatch between... Actually, Shapiro talks about this as well. It's like, if you say something is systemic, then it's, it's almost so big, there's like, what the hell are you going to do? You know, so f at least focusing, even in that model, on individual institutions. Mm -hmm. Like, this institution is corrupt. I'm going to focus with 10 other people or on Or individual that. actions. Or individual actions within mm -hmm. those institutions, you know? Mm -hmm. It's got to narrow down to a degree, otherwise it's completely unmanageable. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I started to get this feeling during the Occupy protests in 2011 or so, mm. where all these people are out there protesting. I felt energized by it, but there was no sense of directing that energy into specific policy goals mm. or initiatives. Yeah. And I got to realizing, like, we're all railing against capitalism. It's like, well, that's so big. It's such an abstraction. Where's capitalism? Where's capitalism? And we're out there in front of these huge bank buildings protesting, and I realized that you know, I thought any minute those executives at the top floor were going to realize, like, okay, push the emergency button, spew cash out of the ATMs onto the streets, and we'll disperse the people immediately. Yeah. And because capitalism, it, it's inside of all of us. When we mm. see money, we're like, we become money grubbers. And mm. so it's like, where's the enemy, really, yeah. if we're fighting mm. against something that systemic? Yeah. Right. It's mm. not separate from you. Mm. Right. And it, it shifts the anger from being just directed outward to a different kind of emotion that's maybe like, maybe just as urgent, but more curious, like, okay, this is something I need to exercise from yeah. myself as much as from anyone else. Sure. And to Peterson's point about that kind of medium resolution grand narrative, yeah. the necessity of that, because I was at Occupy London, and when all the police came with the horses, and we were all standing there, I had the thought, I was like, 
hmm, am I willing to die for this? <laughs> and then I was like, <laughs> what are is you it? guys willing to die for it? Like, what are we willing to die for? Because yeah. that is the kind of energy that actually does change systems. Yeah. Is when it's like, and unfortunately it often happens when people are s in such a horrible position that yeah. it's like, well, yeah, that death could be preferable to my life. But finding that, you know, the reintroduction of meta narrative in a new way for me is so essential because mm -hmm. it's like, what can we all get behind? Because currently we still don't really have that. Like, what can we all agree on is worth living for and dying for? Yeah. And that's also where Peterson's, you know, one of his critiques and challenges, which is hard to hear from the left, is he brings back that old and charged word of responsibility, personal responsibility. And where is that in these conversations? And it's really provocative to try and grapple with, but to the point about uh, low resolution grand narrative, mm -hmm. you know, clearly you're fighting on behalf of, of these systemic oppressions and, and certain oppressed peoples, but then it's like, he used this phrase in one podcast or interview and he was like, he was talking, I think, about the Christian tradition. He's like, well, at a certain point you stand up and say, this is my cross to bear. And this radical mystery that we're in as human beings is we all show up and we all have our forms of suffering. It can look a million different ways. Mm. And some, there's some archetypal like, truth and level mm. that speaks to. Like, we each have a cross. I have my own cross. I know it really well. I've been in therapy a long time. I'm working on my shadow, but... I don't know, you know, what it's like to be a person of color. Or I, there's so many different ways, but if we forget that truth, there is some mystery in which we're all here on earth and we're trying to carry what's ours, act in the world and help others and be a, a locus of sanity and kindness mm -hmm. and goodness in this world. Yeah. Mm. Maybe that's the trick. Yeah, individuality is the highest value, but your individuality is a gift. It doesn't belong to you mm. in the sense that on the one hand you could if you're religious God gave you your individuality mm. if you're secular society mm. instilled in you those values raised you to mm. be capable of that mm -hmm. once we start thinking that I belong to myself mm. I think we get into problems right yeah. and so without an overarching grand, low resolution grand narrative without all, that right. meaning mm. yeah. Me it's, is the only meaning left. Yes, mm. me mm. is the only thing left. That's why everything gets relativized and culturally constructed. Mm. Yeah. There's a great line in the Camille Paglia, Jordan Peterson talk, where I think she said something like, the 60s, that consciousness is primary. And a lot of the time, the, the left makes the mistake of thinking identity is primary. And it's actually the thing that goes beyond identity that's primary. Mm. That the, the revelation of the 60s and of Jung is that consciousness, the thing that transcends our current situation is the thing that's primary. Mm -hmm. um, that was a, that, and that was kind of the revolution of the 60s, I guess, sparked by psychedelics and sparked by kind of the realization of, wow, our consciousness is so much bigger than we ever realized. Mm -hmm. um, and that's maybe the sort of transcendent value that we need to kind of recover. Yeah, and it's like a capital C consciousness that doesn't yeah. exclude the body in the physical mm -hmm. world, but somehow the body and the physical world are manifestations or expressions of this big... Mm -hmm. C, you know, capital C consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. well, I don't think Camille Paglia was talking about something that's no. stuck in the skull, you yeah. know? Well, no. it was Jung or someone, I can't remember who, talked about individuation as the move from um, the center of gravity being the ego, mm -hmm. or the, S, the self with a small s, yeah. to the self with a capital S. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That move of your center of gravity, your identity, from small s, s self to large s self, yeah is a profound move and that that like without that move yeah it's because then it's like you get what i would say amount to a kind of socialist value system but from the inside out rather mm -hmm. than being imposed by an authoritarian government saying mm -hmm. you must do this way be this mm -hmm. way you must give this much in tax whatever it's more intrinsically motivated mm -hmm. yeah you know yeah. and that's it's that's the shift that i think i'm looking for yeah. totally. mm -hmm. we yeah we had this thought the other day it's like the word should. There's a lot of shoulds, yeah. especially on the left, and it's like, sh should is a very interesting word, and it's a very interesting kind of state to be in, whereas actually, <laughs> mm -hmm. it, what we're saying is we, we can get to a place where it's not a should, like our, our morality doesn't come from a place of should. It comes from a place of, of genuine desire to yeah. do the things that we do. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the left has, has, has started as a kind of resistance to the shoulds of the of the 50s and 60s as a counterculture but it's become its own yeah. kind of yeah. church mm, yeah. yeah i guess in jungian terms it's um or kind of campbell uh mythic journey terms it's like when 
because we're kind of talking there's the risk of an ego self confusion you know the ego becomes confused with the self and it's this kind of deep narcissism and it's more of a when the ego takes its natural place contained within the self mm -hmm. then you should there's no should you will you will behave in a certain mm -hmm. way and that that's mm -hmm. kind of the back to the point i was making of this this desire for things to be a certain way and should be that way and should maybe be forced to be that way that's that's some of where authoritarianism comes from uh, on both sides actually yeah. instead of this when we reach a certain level of understanding within ourselves and as a community mm -hmm. we will behave in a certain way we will behave this way right. um and it's a you know it's a tricky one it's a tricky one to get to because it's very convincing the ego can be very convincing mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i was not going to say it because i don't know it uh, i just had heard brett weinstein in conversation, it might have been under Rogan, it might have been with his brother Eric mm -hmm. on the Rubin show. Um, but when they talk about game theories and they're talking about like these valleys and peaks, mm. and he talks about is it game B or yeah. um, and I don't remember the name less something. He talks about this archer who's become well known, or he mm. has these YouTubes that are, and he's apparently broken all the rules of classical traditional archery. I wish I could remember his name, or I'm kind of butchering this, but w I watched it, I looked him up and I watched it, and it's like, to our sensibility, it looks sloppy. It's, not, it's nothing like w the way we see archery today, but of course, the argument is that this is how people in indigenous cultures, and, and they could shoot three at a time, or shoot rapidly and hit targets and be effective in warfare mm -hmm. or whatnot. But anyway, his point in bringing that up was that in this question of what's now, what's emerging, what is, how do we move forward, that he's saying it's almost like you, you're in the system, you're in the system until there's kind of a spontaneous leap mm -hmm. and step out of that. And you mm -hmm. kind of step mm -hmm. completely out. Yeah. No one sees it coming. Phase it's phase it's a phase yeah. shift. Yeah. It's like there's enough, mm -hmm. there's enough that's evolved and you hit a tipping point and it's mm -hmm. a phase shift. And so I've just kind of been meditating and ruminating on that. Like it might not be what we're thinking. We're thinking in these ways and something mm -hmm. might come completely from left field. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like about the intellectual dark web, especially Brett Weinstein and, and Jimmy mm. Wheel and Eric and some of these others, is they're really remaining open. Let's not, mm. let's make sure we don't think we know mm. everything. There's, there's an interesting, and I think it's probably the biggest um, split within the intellectual dark web, because you've got people like Steven Pinker in it, who are like these kind of very Panglossian. Everything's the world great. Is, everything's guys. great. The world is getting better. <laughs> what are you everything's worried much about? better. Right. And and even you saw that on the recent podcast with Shapiro, Wein, Eric Weinstein, um, Jordan Peterson, and Dave Rubin. Yeah. Eric Weinstein was the only one saying, "Hang on, I I, I don't think you're right. I yeah. think I think things are e getting existentially more dangerous. Even though you you track kind of wealth or whatever, and everything's getting better, the risks are so much worse, and and we're." kind of screwed and most of the the guys who I know I really respect like the Daniel Schmachtenberger, Jordan Greenhall, Eric and Brett Weinstein are all like waving red flags and saying hang on the existential risks are so huge the technology is so much better that we're in we're in a really difficult situation but also we, we, we talked to Daniel Schmachtenberger and he used that phrase the phase shift mm. and he said well look at you could look at all of these indicators and see wow this is this is all getting very dangerous, very difficult, our, tr our hardwired tribalism is likely to kill us, I mean all these things are, are true, but if you looked at, he uses the, an example of a pregnant mother, the baby, at nine months it would look like the baby was about to die, because you don't know that there's a, there's a phase shift about to happen, mm -hmm. and that's how he's choosing to see it, as these are the birth pangs for something new, mm -hmm. and we don't know, Thing we don't know. That there could very easily be a phase shift that we're that we're going through into a completely new phase. Yeah, mm. yeah. And I feel like the best we can <coughs> do right now is try to cultivate a sensitivity, a heightened sensitivity to possibility, yeah. mm. so that when that new thing that's going to get us through this bottleneck appears, we see it, mm. we feel it, and it's not going to look like what we're used to imagining as the solution. Mm. Mm. And you know, as we've said, the solutions of the past that have been fought for, once that group fighting for it wins, you end up with a system worse than the one you just destroyed, right? So mm -hmm. it's not gonna look like what we're used to looking for. Mm -hmm. How do we cultivate that sense of imagination that's required, um, John Keats called it negative capability. Mm -hmm. You can think about what's not yet actualized, 
and hold yourself in that space of tension mm. so that when that phase shift is ready to happen, you can jump to the next ship that's going to take us into the future. Mm. I heard someone use the metaphor of like a baby bird in the shell, in the egg, mm. and that there's some release of, of, of a gas or some, mm. something that happens and the bird suddenly, after resting there, says, I need to get out, and it just doesn't even know what it's doing. It starts pecking, yeah. and it's fracturing this encasing shell, mm. and then it just emerges into that next stage. It feels there's some resonance in that kind of mm. metaphor. Yeah. So it's, I think, in one sense, we're fucked. Things are really bad right now. And, like, just to give Steven Pinker a little bit of a nod, like, there's the potential for something great. Mm. Like, with the technology that we have, Mm -hmm. with a different social organization. Like, we don't have a production problem, we mm -hmm. have a distribution problem. Mm -hmm. Is one way I've heard it phrased, in terms mm -hmm. of there are still so many hungry people, why is mm -hmm. that? We have plenty of food. Mm -hmm. So we just need a new way, a new way of thinking. Mm -hmm. With the technology that we have, we could do some so, yeah. pretty great William things. Gibson, who says the future is here, but it's not widely distributed. That's <laughs> it, I like that. That's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, yeah. thank you guys, that was yeah, really, really great. That was a blast. Thanks so much yeah. for having yeah. us. Yeah.